Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Tamara Toryakova on the Russian Far East. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the uh, CG Chair of Global Security in the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And I'm very pleased every week to welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation uh, to speak about some uh, pressing important issue in global governance, international public policy, international affairs. And today I'm very happy to welcome uh, Tamara Troyakova, who's professor in the School of International and Regional Studies in the Far Eastern Federal University in Vladivostok, and also the head of the Department of International Relations there. So welcome, uh, Tamara. Uh, thank you for coming a long way from Vladivostok and joining <laughs> us here today. Yeah. I uh, think a lot of us uh, don't know much about the Russian Far East, and uh, I certainly don't know much about the Far Eastern Federal University. So maybe you can start by telling us a bit about your university and the region in which it's located. Uh, okay. Uh, our university is the number one university in the whole region, you know, it's because Vladivostok is the south part of the Russian Far East. And if you look to the Russian Far East, it's one third of the Russian territory. And uh, actually, you know, if you look to the Vladivostok, it's the south part of the Russian Far East. Uh, and we have several universities, but just recently, because of the uh, special policy, you know, so we got the status of the first and federal university and some kind of combination of uh, different universities, so like a technical university and uh, commercial university, and just now we have the huge university uh, it's a, uh, on the federal level. And if you look to the Russian uh, federal, um, I don't know, it's like a structure, uh, the Russian Far East, it's uh, one third of the territory. And, but if you look to population, it's only about uh, four or five percent of the Russian population. Very small. Yeah, yeah. it's very small. But uh, why it was uh, located in the Vladivostok? Because Vladivostok, it's not real north. It's uh, some kind of south part of the Russian Far East. And what is important, uh, this location, location, it's very important for everybody. Uh, I think it's for university also, because we have close neighbors as a China, uh, South Korea and North Korea, of course, and uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And it's a good opportunity to communicate with our close neighbors and to be such kind of, you know, it's an international maybe institute in this area. And I think it's a, the good opportunity for uh, integration and the good opportunity to be uh, to attract more foreign students to our university. And we have several programs for international uh, students also, uh, mainly from China. But uh, just recently, our school, you know, it's begin a master program for foreigners. And we have students from South Korea, and we have uh, students from Japan, and also uh, maybe uh, from Vietnam, you know, it's in, we are we are ready for right. yeah for students from a uh, from Canada also I think it's uh, mm, from very possibly soon. Yeah. There's a lot of stocks also the most important port city in the yeah. Russian Far East. That's so it's right. the most regionally and globally connected. Uh, yeah, because it's a Vladivostok, it's not only university city, but I think it's at first it's a port city. Mm -hmm. And I like this idea about the port city, you know, it's a port city in, in the world. They have some kind of similarities, you know, it's, it's windy and it's some kind of mixture of different uh, uh, people. And I think it's during the Soviet times, it was really, you know, it's a, uh, a good opportunity for the local people, for Soviet people, to go abroad as a sailors, as a fishermen, and just try, you know, it's, uh, to compare what is uh, life is in our country, in Soviet <laughs> Union, and uh, abroad, you know, it's saying. Right. Uh, now you said that uh, Soviet, uh, Russian Far East is one third of the country, yeah. physically four to five yeah, percent yeah. of the population. Mm -hmm. What proportion of the population is actually ethnically Russian, as opposed to uh, something like 95. 95%. Yeah, yeah. And the remainder are um, various 
primarily indigenous uh, communities? Indigenous people, and uh, actually, uh, if you look to the maritime territory, because Vladivostok is the capital of maritime territory, and if you look to the Russian Far East, it's a Magadan territory, and it's a Habarovsk territory, and Sakhalin, and Kamchatka also. But maritime territory is the most populated. It's about the population, it's about two million people. Mm. And because of South, and if you look to the history, you know, it's how it was a mar maritime territory uh, was uh, founded, and it was a, actually it was a part of uh, China, and it was uh, many years ago. It was Beijing Treaty, 1860, and because of this treaty, you know, it's uh, we Russia got this piece of land. It's maritime territory, and it, it was really good because Vladivostok, the only free ice port in the whole region, and I think it's very important for us. Yeah. But during the Soviet uh, period, it was just far. Uh, post, you know, and, and just now, if you look to the translation, it's some kind of uh, just a little artificial name, you know, it's a Vladivostok to rule the East. Mm. It sounds just yeah. a little, you know, it's a political, but in general it was real, you know, it's... Uh, uh, and how uh, much autonomy does the Russian Far East have from Moscow, and, and what, what issue areas would it have autonomy over? Uh, during the Soviet time it was not real autonomy. Uh, but uh, during the last 20 years, you know, it's, uh, it was some kind of uh, shift. Uh, at the beginning of 90s, it was some kind of freedom. Uh, why it was freedom? Because we were remote territory and the uh, federal government, they have no resources. Uh, they have no um, maybe time to rule the situation. And the local people, they were, you know, it's uh, maybe uh, they got more freedom to go abroad. I think it's, it was really important because during the economic crisis, you know, it was lines, it was ration cards for food, you know, it's, uh, and also, on the other hand, uh, the local population uh, got a chance to go abroad to China. Hmm. Non-visa agreement. You have to organize some kind of group of people, you know, it's mm. a five or ten, and you can go to China to buy some consumer goods. And if you like, if you uh, have some kind of entrepreneurial, uh, you know, it's abilities, you can buy more and to sell to uh, in the market. And it was a special move in shuttle traders. And it was really good for us in the 90s. But just now, I think it's... Uh, uh, we have more structure area and we have no real maybe uh, opportunity to be uh, independent. Mm. Well, we'll talk about that again in a moment when we come back. Mm -hmm. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you said the region had quite a lot of independence and autonomy. Was that also true of the, the government? The government is in Khabarovsk, and the governor was a relatively independent actor regionally, or, or not? Uh, it, it, it's not like it, because if you look at the Russian Far East, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a composition of different territories. And uh, Khabarovsk, it's not, maybe, you know, it's, it's, there is a competition between Khabarovsk and Vladivostok. Khabarovsk, it's a typical Russian provincial city with, uh, you know, it's a traditional history. And, uh, but Vladivostok, because of the port city, you know, it's, and we have maritime territory, and there is a competition between uh, Khabarovsk territory and Vladivostok territory. But if you look to the uh, structure, you know, it's every territory has own right, uh, but in general, if you look to the whole region, the northern part, they have nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, but if you look to the south part, Vladivostok and Habarovsk, they have more opportunities because Habarovsk, they have a good, you know, it's economic relation with China also. And also, we can look to the uh, further, you know, it's uh, to China, it's uh, Amur Oblast. They have also good relationship with uh, China. 
in uh, the border region, they have some kind of privilege. Uh, if you look to the north, to the far north, uh, to Magadan and Chukotka, they have some kind of uh, geographical privilege to uh, to do something uh, to cooperate with Alaska. Mm. And at the beginning of 90s, it was really good, you know, it's a, uh, uh, for uh, local people in uh, Chukotka, the Aboriginal people, they can go to American Nome mm -hmm. and to maybe for a birthday party, you know, it's, right. and for some kind of, because they are relatives. And right, yeah. of course, yeah. Now, yeah. the Russian Far East is Russia's footprint in the Asia Pacific, which is the yeah. world's most dynamic, most exciting, and some would say most dangerous mm -hmm. region. And yet, of course, Moscow is a very long way away. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, about so how, 10 how hours this flight. Work yeah. In terms of Russian foreign policy and the, mm -hmm. the, the role that Russia can play in the Asia Pacific when, when the Russian Far East is so small in terms of population. And that's right, yeah. Uh, the, the central authorities are so far removed. How do you, how do you see Russia's role now in the Asia Pacific today? Oh, because uh, if you look to the uh, uh, world situation, you know, it's uh, in uh, Asia-Pacific region, it's maybe just now the most developed area, you know, it's, uh, and if you look to the economic development, uh, everybody would like to, to do something in this region, in mm -hmm. the, the Asia-Pacific region. If you look to the history of the Russian foreign policy, I think it's uh, the beginning of such kind of pivot or turning or twisting, uh, it was the, mm, um, I think it's in uh, 80s, with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev Perestroika, and it was a very well-known speech by Gorbachev in July uh, uh, 18, uh, oh, excuse me, 1986, mm -hmm. and it was some kind of a reality, uh, because if you look to the Russian Far East, we have no chance to do something uh, with the European part of uh, country, and we have to be more self-sufficient, and it was the beginning of the Russian foreign policy. Why it was it's, uh, uh, the new thinking, uh, it was Gorbachev, you know, it's words about new thinking about Russia in the Asia-Pacific region, and during the last 20 years it was several plans to develop this area, to uh, cooperate and uh, to do some kind of economic uh, and maybe humanitarian, uh, maybe some kind of um, projects. And our university is a part of this project, you know, it's uh, something about human security because migration is a very important uh, point for the Russian Far East because it's the beginning of 90s, it was some kind of Chinese threat. Too many, you know, it's uh, it was some kind of political slogan about million of Chinese, you know, it's a conquer the Russian Far East because they have no room in, in China, yeah. you know, it's a too many Chinese and uh, they will go and they will conquer the whole, the Russian Far East. And this slogan, it's still popular, you know, it's between politicians. They would like to defend the mouth of land from Chinese threat. And I think it's a real, you know, it's a funny because in, uh, uh, politicians, they would like uh, to use conspiracy theory, right, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a real uh, uh, good for politician to be the populist and if you remember it was, um, at the beginning of 90s it was a border issue with China, how to settle this border issue and the uh, governor uh, Evgeny Nazratenko, he was very well known for his patriotism, you know, it's uh, no piece of motherland to China. But uh, this uh, issue was settled very successfully in uh, the beginning of this uh, century. And does Russia now understand its main interests in the Asia Pacific as economic in nature? Uh, uh, at first, yes, it's, I think it's economic because it's a natural way to communicate with neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look to the political situation, I think it's uh, uh, the last uh, year, September 2012, it was APEC meeting mm -hmm. and it was some kind of symbolic, not only for the Russian Far East, I think it's for Russia also because President Putin, you know, it's, he was very proud to go to Vladivostok and to uh, uh, 
talk about this, the Russian Far East and the Russia in the Asia Pacific region, and it was really good. But um, I'm very skeptical about such kind of, you know, it's a rhetoric about Russia in the Asia Pacific because it takes time. And just now, if you look to the whole, you know, it's a uh, last two, uh, 20 years, too many uh, declaration intentions, uh, but implementations, not really, you know, it's implementations. Um, if you look to um, uh, our relationship with Japan, mm -hmm. because the main, you know, it's a problem or the main obstacle to develop economic relationship with Japan, I think is a territorial issue mm -hmm. about uh, Kuril Islands, Southern Kuril Islands or Four Kuril Islands. And because if you look to the, uh, uh, the history uh, Vladivostok, you know, it's, it was some kind of cosmopolitan city mm -hmm. because it uh, it was uh, uh, Chinese population, Japanese and Russian Korean also. Mm. Yeah. Very good. I'd like to speak more about that when we come mm -hmm. back. If you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast, look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So we were talking about territorial issues, and yeah. of course, uh, one of the big issues in the Asia Pacific now is territory. It's uh, one of the few places on the world that has uh, active and hot territorial disputes that could plausibly um, spill over into large scale, escalate into large scale war between <laughs> nuclear armed <laughs> countries. Now, the uh, dispute you just mentioned, the uh, Southern Kuril is what the Japanese call Northern Territories yeah. issue. That's a long standing issue dating all the way back to 1945. It's not one of the issues that's on the front pages of the newspapers uh, today. So two questions for you. Uh, one, what do you anticipate happening with respect to Japan specifically on the Southern Kuril's Northern Territories issue? And, and secondly, what's Russia's uh, position, attitude uh, with respect to the other main disputes at the moment, um, Senkaku, Diaoyu Islands, uh, South China Sea disputes, maybe to a lesser extent, the Korean-Japanese dispute over Dr. Takeshima. Uh, just now, if you look to the uh, concepts of the Russian foreign policy, you know, it's we have no real uh, interest, you know, it's, it's not real primary interest, you know, it's uh, to do something with territorial issues. And if you look to the, all this uh, territorial dispute, I think it's uh, uh, the, the most important for Russia, it's uh, uh, Kuril Islands. And uh, uh, if you look to the 90s, and it was some kind of real good chance to settle this issue, because uh, uh, Boris, Boris Yeltsin policy was just uh, to have a good you know, it's a relationship with Japan, and uh, it will be maybe a 1956 declaration just to divide, you know, it's a two islands to Russia, two islands to Japan, and maybe uh, would be beginning of the process. But unfortunately, um, at the beginning of 90s, it was too many policy rhetoric and uh, just now, it was some kind of, if you look to the, uh, the whole uh, story, it was some kind of ups and downs with uh, Kuril Islands. Uh, but the reality is really uh, uh, quite different. Uh, because if you go to the um, uh, South Kuril, you know, it's, it was bad infrastructure, no real ports, no real pier, and uh, how many uh, people, you know, it's, uh, 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 can live in uh, Kuril Islands. It's some kind of seasonal fishing industry and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I visited uh, Kuril Islands because of my curiosity, of course, and, I, and it was really, uh, uh, it, it was my personal opinion, you know, it's, and I'm still, you know, it's uh, uh, good. In <clears throat> I think it's uh, better, you know, it's, to give these islands to Japan because it will be more useful, not only for local people from Hokkaido or from Kuril Islands, I think it will be good for the whole region and would be uh, some kind of uh, good example how to solve these territorial issues. So when you say give the islands to Japan, you mean the, 
the two of the four or uh, all four? Uh, maybe two for the beginning. Right. Because if you look to Habermas, it's not real, you know, it's... Uh, it's a rocks, yeah. Yeah, it's a rocks, you know, it's, it's some kind of symbolic yeah. rocks. And, and um, y you, it's difficult to find the uh, permanent population. Uh, because uh, the permanent population is all Europeans and they would like to go just to make money, you know, it's, they have a good salary just to spend uh, two or three years and then came back to Ukraine or to European part of uh, country and I think it will be good. But if you look to the, uh, all these arguments by politicians, it's something about 200 miles zone, you know, it's about fishery. But look to the reality with fishery. You know, it's, uh, uh, in Vladivostok we have no real uh, fish market. Mm -hmm. Why? It's with scrap and some kind of seafood products because it's more profitable to sell to Japan. And, it's, uh, and uh, the government, actually, they have no control, you know, it's uh, for uh, fishing. <laughs> mm. uh, because, uh, yes, at the beginning it was some kind of Chinese fishermen, you know, it's, uh, just catch fish in, in near Kuril Islands, but just now they have monopoly, you know, it's as a Russian uh, fisherman, businessman, they have monopoly. And uh, the previous governor of Vladivostok of Maritime Territory, he began his uh, politician career as a fisherman mm. and just to sell all this uh, sea food to Japan. Right, yeah. but it would be, I guess, a an economic blow if Japan were catching those crabs and so on and instead of Russian crab But fishermen. just now, but just now, you know, it's, a, it's not profitable for Russia, oh, I see. for the local population, because we have no chance to, uh, you know, it's, uh, to eat uh, sushi, you know, it's with, right. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, with fish, you know, right. it's because we have, uh, and uh, if you look to the price, you know, it's of some kind of caviar or crab, you know, it's, uh, you can go to Moscow and you can buy, you know, it's uh, one kilogram, let's imagine, one kilogram of crabs for the same price in Vladivostok. Could you imagine the difference mm. for the local people? And right. uh, local people in Vladivostok, they try to remember it was 50 years ago, it was crabs, you know, it's, and it was nothing. And the kilogram of meat was just 10 rubles and crab you can buy for three rubles. Mm. And it was real, you know, it's a good situation, but just now you have right. no real f f uh, uh, fresh seafood in Vladivostok. And Russia's been quite quiet on the other territorial disputes in, in the Far East. And is that because it, it doesn't particularly want to draw attention to the dispute with Japan, or it doesn't actually see itself as having a role in those? Uh, maybe uh, Russia has no real... Uh, Russia is not maybe the major player in these issues. And maybe, I don't know, because if you look to the uh, Russian, you know, it's a priorities, maybe China is a number one. Mm -hmm. It's our partner, it's a strategic partnership, no doubts, you know, it's a, and that is the reason uh, that China maybe has some kind of priorities. <laughs> Very good. We'll be back mm -hmm. one last time with uh, Tamara uh, Troyakova. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So what about the future? The Russian Far East, I remember, has always been seen as an area of great promise and opportunity and potential, a bit like Canada's North. And uh, I think people are traditionally uh, disappointed by the reality lagging behind the expectations. Uh, is there still that sense that the Russian Far East is an area of enormous uh, potential? Uh, do you think that's realistic if so? And how do you see the, the region developing and, and as a result uh, the, the region's role in the Asia Pacific developing? I would like to be very optimistic about the future, you know, and say the near future and the distant future for this region. Maybe I doubt something about the near future, but the distant future, I think it's, a, it's some kind of natural way for the Russian Far East to develop, to integrate to the Asia-Pacific region because of the location. And if you look to the, uh, mm, uh, the federal government, you know, it's a plan. Just now we have uh, uh, 
special uh, ministry. It's the Ministry of Development of the Russian Far, uh, for far East. And uh, uh, we have to change some kind of attitude. You know, it's a traditional attitude. Uh, if you look at the Russian Far East, it's a resource base. You know, it's a timber, fish, and some kind of gold and diamonds from Yakutia also. But maybe because uh, we, we have some kind of different uh, time, it's some, uh, I like this idea about globalization and uh, maybe globalization it's good for the Russian Far East. Maybe, uh, why? Because we need some kind of more technology. We need some kind of investment to develop this area. And um, if you look to the uh, Russian government policies, they would like you know, to, to invest more money and uh, uh, maybe uh, Vladivostok is the number one because uh, it, it was some kind of huge amount of money to develop this area. In, of course, Vladivostok. Uh, uh, Vladivostok is a symbol. And now it's like a symbolic uh, speech by Gorbachev. Uh, and just now maybe a symbolic event, APEC summit in uh, 2012. And just now, maybe the beginning of uh, good, you know, it's a uh, 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 future for this region. And uh, we have some kind of uh, several projects. And I think it's one of the projects. It's uh, maybe just, it's not real, uh, maybe it's an academic project. Still, uh, Russia is a mediator uh, between Northeast Asian countries and Arctic countries. Mm. And I think it's a real good, you know, it's an opportunity for Russia, specifically for the Russian Far East, to attract more investment. Uh, for example, from South Korea with uh, shipping industry, we need m maybe new uh, icebreaker with nuclear power, and we need maybe more uh, uh, good ships, and uh, also we need some kind of uh, uh, construction of uh, port infrastructure and maybe we can use uh, Chinese investment and Chinese labor also mm. because it's a very important uh, problem with shortage of labor. It's not like, a, uh, you know, it's a labor in general, but maybe we need some kind of high technology, you know, it's workers to work uh, for development of right. our area. Because just now, if you look to the foreign uh, labor, we have uh, Chinese workers, uh, North Korean workers, and just now, just recently, it's a new, uh, some kind of uh, uh, trend. Uh, we have more uh, work, uh, labor from uh, Central Asian republics. You know, during the Soviet era, the Far East was pretty isolated, and in fact, Vladivostok was a closed city. It was the yeah. main naval base. Uh, what's it like now? Are there foreign businessmen uh, coming in, uh, foreign governments? beginning to be well represented in the city and in the region? Are we beginning to see the integration of the Yeah, the uh, because uh, yeah, uh, if you go to Khabarovsk, you know, so you, you can find some kind of consulate, foreign consulate also. But if you go to Vladivostok, we have more consulates. You know, it's American consulate, Japanese, South Korean, uh, Vietnamese, and North Korean also. And if you look to the, some kind of companies, you know, it's we have American and we have Canadian also, but it's a, uh, not real a consulate, but it's some kind mm -hmm. of businessman, you know, it's, uh, they are doing pretty good. And mm, I think it, what was uh, really important for Vladivostok, it's some kind of history background. It's a cosmopolitan city. And I think it's uh, Vladivostok has more potential, you know, it's, uh, to develop a uh, relationship with uh, uh, foreign countries and uh, with America also, you know, it's because at the beginning of 90s, it's with direct flight, Alaska Airlines uh, from Anchorage to Vladivostok. And just now, maybe they have a plan, you know, it's, but just now we can go from Vladivostok to abroad via Seoul. Hmm. Yeah, but because of all these uh, plans, you know, it's we have just new constructed uh, a big airport, Vladivostok, it's an international airport uh, for Vladivostok and maybe uh, some, you know, it's a company they will use Vladivostok as a, uh, to go to Alaska or to go to the uh, Southeast uh, Asian countries also. 
And I think it's a port uh, facilities also, it's important. It's not only for Vladivostok, because at the beginning of 90s, it was a big international project, the Tumangan project. It's some kind of triangle uh, with China, uh, in uh, North Korea, in Russia, in Japan. And it was some kind of expectation, but reality is just really bad. But uh, I I'm very optimistic. Let's wait and see, you know, it's uh, and maybe it will be better. And will there be a meeting of minds between the, the local government and, and Moscow, or are there important differences in the understanding of the, the interests in regional engagement? Mm, I think just now, you know, it's a, if you look at the Russian policy, it's some kind of interior policy, it's a foreign policy. Uh, and for Russia just now, it's a time for isolation. Uh, why is isolation? Because the economic situation is not very good. And I would like to see that uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, struggle inside of Russian elites. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it's a time, you know, it's uh, just to wait. Uh, but uh, also, it's an opportunity for a uh, local regional elite to be more independent. Mm. Maybe uh, it will be good for businessmen, you know, it's, uh, they have money, they have some kind of uh, uh, ability to be more independent. Mm. Uh, and if you look to the rhetoric, you know, it's uh, by our current President uh, Putin, you know, it's, uh, I think it's uh, the good example is some, something uh, for Vladivostok, or I think uh, for the whole region, something about uh, uh, used Japanese cars, you know, it's, it was the beginning of our development <laughs> and it's a, it was really fruitful cooperation. Every uh, local family has one or two Japanese cars and it's good. But the federal government, they decided no way. <laughs> so interesting. Well, it'll be fascinating to watch the mm. development of the region. Mm -hmm. uh, always certainly has a lot of enormous potential in terms of uh, natural resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think a lot of opportunity for Russia to play a constructive role in the Asia Pacific. So we hope to have you back to reflect in a few years about how it's been progressing. And thank you for coming in and helping mm -hmm. us understand the Russian Far East better. Thank you to the audience for joining us and join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. National and Regional Studies in the Far Eastern Federal University in Vladivostok and also the head of the Department of International Relations there. So welcome uh, Tamara. Uh, thank you for coming a long way from Vladivostok and joining <laughs> us here today. Yeah. I uh, think a lot of us uh, don't know much about the Russian Far East and uh, I certainly don't know much about the Far Eastern Federal University. So maybe you can start by telling us a bit about your university and the region in which it's located. Uh, okay. Uh, our university is the number one university in the whole region. You know, it's because Vladivostok is the south part of the Russian Far East. And if you look to the Russian Far East, it's one third of the Russian territory. And uh, actually, you know, if you look to the Vladivostok, it's the south part of the Russian Far East. Uh, and we have several universities, but just recently, because of the uh, special policy, you know, so we got the status of the First and Federal University and some kind of combination of diff the different universities. So I think it's at first it's uh, Port City. Mm -hmm. And I like this idea about the Port City, you know, it's a Port City in, in the world, they have some kind of similarities, you know, it's, it's windy and it's some kind of mixture of different uh, uh, people. And I think it's during the Soviet times, it was really, you know, it's a, a good opportunity for the local people, for Soviet people to go abroad as a sailors, as a fishermen, and just try, you know, it's a, to compare what is uh, life is in our country, in Soviet <laughs> Union, and uh, abroad, you know, it's saying. Right. Uh, now you said that uh, Soviet, uh, Russian Far East is one third of the country, yeah. and physically four to five yeah, percent of the population. Mm -hmm. What proportion of the population is actually ethnically Russian, as opposed to uh, something? Like 95. 95 yeah. percent. Yeah. And the remainder are um, various 
primarily indigenous uh, communities? Indigenous people and uh, our close neighbors. And to be such kind of, you know, it's an international maybe institute in this area. And I think it's a, the good opportunity for uh, integration and the good opportunity to be uh, to attract more foreign students to our university and we have several programs for international uh, students also uh, mainly from China but uh, just recently our school you know it's a begin a master program for foreigners and we have students from South Korea and we have uh, students from Japan and also uh, maybe uh, from Vietnam you know it's in we are we are ready for right. yeah for students from a uh, from Canada also I think it's uh, mm, from very possibly soon yeah. Vladivostok is also the most important port city in the yeah. Russian Far East That's so it's right. the most regionally and globally connected uh, yeah because it's a Vladivostok it's not a only university city but I Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Tamara Troyakova on the Russian Far East. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the uh, CG Chair of Global Security in the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And I'm very pleased every week to welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance and Innovation. Uh, to speak about some uh, pressing important issue in global governance, international public policy, international affairs. And today I'm very happy to welcome uh, Tamara Troyakova, who's professor in the School of International... Like a technical university and uh, commercial university, and just now we have the huge university. Uh, it's a, uh, on the federal level. And if you look to the Russian uh, federal... Uh, I don't know, it's like a structure. Uh, the Russian Far East, it's a one third of the territory. And But if you look at the population, it's only about uh, four or five percent of the Russian population. Very small. Yeah, yeah. it's very small. But uh, why it was uh, located in the Vladivostok? Because Vladivostok, it's not real north. It's uh, some kind of south part of the Russian Far East. And what is important, uh, this location. Location, it's very important for everybody. Uh, I think it's for university also. Because we have close neighbors as a China, uh, South Korea, and North Korea, of course, and uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And it's a good opportunity to communicate with 